Anyway, let's begin this uh, uh, discussion this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings, for the ability to have freedom to meet here and talk about you. And especially we thank you for the wonderful things you've done for the human race to rescue us from this horrible, horrible hole that we're in. And we ask that you'll send the Holy Spirit to help us fully appreciate today all that you've done. Amen. Okay. Well, today we're going to talk about our salvation and we're going to find out, is there something we need to do? You, I don't need to tell the all of you in this room, that there's a lot of controversy about exactly what is required for us to do our part of the deal for God to correct our genome. Here's a review. It's been a few weeks now, so let's review. Christ came to this earth to take on our burden of mobile genetic elements. Half of his genome came from heaven. The other half came from Mary. He lived a life where he did not waver from God's law in the least particular, thus mastering the mobile genetic element driven inclinations. This mastery is made available to humanity through the Holy Spirit. Many of the mobile genetic elements afflicting the human genome are sequestered in the heterochromatin. The process whereby the mobile genetic elements are marked for sequester is, in the most cases, dependent upon microRNAs. The microRNA system is one of the most essential body communication modalities and works both directly on the DNA and on the messenger RNA. In this way, the microRNAs act as the ultimate editors of the genome. The parable of the grafting of a branch onto a grapevine in John 15 gives us an illustration of how Christ's overcoming of the mobile genetic elements can be applied to us. Science has clearly demonstrated that the grafted branch, which would be us in this parable, humanity, can overcome multiple genetic elements only by the microRNAs that it receives from the stem of the vine, which represents Christ. And again, I just want to stop here a second. If you go read the literature which has been published since 1999 on this, it is a perfect illustration of the plan of salvation and of what sanctification is all about. It is, it is spot on. And do I think Christ just serendipitously happened to hit on this idea? No. I think this was put in there specifically. It meant something to everyone through the ages, but it really means something to us today. It carries all kinds of important information for us today where we now have an understanding of genetics. Sequestering of the mobile genetic elements does not eliminate them from the cell, nor does it replace the code that has been destroyed by the mobile genetic element infestation. Christ became the first fruit to undergo removal of the mobile genetic elements. This occurred on the cross and caused the death of the Son of God. So he did not die from crucifixion. He would have lasted three days, or at least until sundown, when the Roman soldiers came and broke the legs of the two of his two compatriots. He surely would have been alive then. He died much earlier than that. And when I was talking about why Christ, how Christ died and why he had to die, I purposely left out a very long, very interesting dissertation on the fact that when they put the spear in his side and he came out two streams of blood and water, I, I've looked at this extensively and the explanations that I've read earlier from people trying to make sense of this naturally just don't jive. They don't hold up to close scrutiny. This tells us that his death was an, a death like we have not seen before. And I just, we don't have time today, nor did we back then to go through this, but it's very fascinating. That was a very important piece of information that the Holy Spirit preserved for us because it tells us clearly that the type of death he suffered on the cross was not the first death, which we are all subject to. It was a different death. It's the second death, and we're going to talk about that on January 11, when we do number 10. His resurrection and ascension up into heaven is the ultimate proof that the plan was successful in the complete removal of the mobile genetic elements. The incredible part is not only that it could be done in the first place, but also that it was accomplished without changing who Christ was. This is very important. You're removing 
the, the, the latest data from this last week is very convincing. A paper came out that now pretty well shores up the idea that 85% of our genome is mobile genetic element driven or controlled or originated, not just controlled, but originated. With 85% of our genome is mobile genetic element engendered. That's a fantastic amount of information that wasn't there originally that we now have to deal with. This is huge. How can you take away from anything, even take a computer, take a program, if you took away 85% of the data that supports that program, how in the world would you have a program that still ran afterwards? It's incredible. How did he do this? And it's all intertwined. I showed you earlier a, um, remember I showed you that graph, that multicolored graph, how all the different genetic systems are entangled and they finally quit looking because they said everything's connected to everything? How could you take away 85% of those intricate systems uh, interacting with each other and still have something that you, a, a coherent whole at the end that's Christ's personality and who he was was unchanged. That's a miracle. I don't think we'll ever understand how that was done. I think this is one part of the plan of salvation that will be beyond our comprehension. The incredible part is not only that it could be done in the first place, but also that it was accomplished without changing who Christ was, for he is, and this is an important piece of, again, the Bible tucks away these wonderful gems of important pieces of information, Hebrews 12, 29. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. All right, we're going to get some definitions. We're finally at a point where we can really give definitions, and I'm going to go through them rather quickly because I've sort of touched on them before, but we now, you know, as I was just saying earlier, this is sort of a verbal textbook, and so in order to be complete, I'm trying to, to, to um, codify everything that someone would need if they were to go back and go through this and, and actually go looking on their own into the genetic literature. Sin. The unauthorized changing of God's information system. We could have said, or law, because God made the, the law under which genetics works. That's God's law. How, how the, the, you know, the, the DNA is transcribed and then goes out and it's translated with transfer RNA into proteins. That's a law that God made. That's God's law. And so if you're changing any part of that law, whether it's through microRNAs that do editing once there's been transcription, or you stop the transcription, it doesn't matter, or even if you interfere with it down at the ribosomes where it's translated into a protein. Anywhere along that, uh, on that continuum, if you have messed with anything, you have messed with God's law. And I can assure you the mobile genetic elements do all of it. And remember, when we were talking in lecture three about circuitry in our brain, when we're using the devil's circuitry, what are we doing? We are enabling the mobile genetic elements in that part of that neuron's genome to multiply and proliferate. Those are called hot spots. I'm just trying to give you a little catch up. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So now plug it in. If you do, if you're sinning, that means you are transgressing the law. That's a very basic uh, definition now. Whoever commits sin, that means unauthorized addition or subtraction from God's law, for sin is transgression of the law. That's, that's sin. 1 John 3, 4 d defines it very precisely for us, and it works very well in our paradigm. I have just told you from the very beginning that inequity equals mobile genetic elements. And, the, and we're not going to go into that. I purposely have stayed away from that. But the evidence for that actually has to do with what started with Lucifer in the first place. And I'm just going to leave it there. I will give you one other hint. Lucifer was the first one to mess with his information system. And that started the whole thing. Okay, moving on. The kingdom of God, this is very important. We're going to be talking today because if you're going to be sanctified, you want to become a member of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? 
And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, See here or see there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So when you hear a lot of talk about we've got to issue the kingdom of God into this world, we've got to get this dispensation, those people are unfortunately looking to do the wrong thing. Remember what Christ said when he was being ushered into, uh, uh, when, during the Thursday night before he was killed, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, my disciples would pick up swords and fight. This isn't what we're doing. This is a lousy place. I, this is nowhere, doesn't even faintly resemble what my kingdom is like. We've got to go from scratch. The only thing we're trying to do is giving each human being a chance to save their information system because that's the only thing that's going to go through and we're going to show you again later today. Grace. Oh, this is a word that has multiple definitions throughout Christendom. It, 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 it is a, it's a bone of contention for many people. And we're going to look at it today from a genetic point of view. But it's the process which has multiple parts by which God, via the Holy Spirit, removes or renders inactive the code in the genome generated through the devil's operating, operation system via microRNAs. I know that's a mouthful. But again... I'm trying to give you a, 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 an audio textbook here. So when you're doing that, you have to indulge in this type of verbiage for at least a short period of time, which we're doing now. So, removes or renders inactive the code in the genome generated through the devil's operating system via microRNAs. This is a generalization. You're going to find out that there's other ways it's done, but I'm trying to keep it simple. 90% or so is done with the microRNAs. Writes new code to replace the original code destroyed by that system. That's very important. Because guess what? We can't run on no code. And 85% of our code is defective. So we've got to get rid of the defective stuff and we need new stuff written or we're not going to function. There's no human being there. So this is, this is equally important. If we... In the past, growing up in, in Christian Gemma, in general, uh, I was believed that you know it was just getting rid of sin. That's the only thing you had to do. When actually, probably the lion's share of the work is to rewrite new code. Getting rid of the of the bad stuff is hard and it's entangled. But once you've gotten rid of the, the, the mobile genetic elements, you have a huge void, and that's where God's creative power comes in. And I'm going to give you a hint. When he's done doing the canvas of your genetic mobile information, let me repeat this, when he's done with the painting the canvas of your new information system, he signs it. His name will be in their foreheads. Just like a Picasso, just like a Monet, when they were done with their masterpieces, they signed them on the, on the bottom. What he does for us when he rewrites us is an absolute masterpiece and he signs it and each one of us is different. It's just like that uh, any one of the masters who made multiple, painted multiple pictures, signs each one of them. God signs each one of us. He says, I'm proud of it. Look what I've done. Look at this masterpiece, but I've got billions of them. Is that the seal of God? Well, this, no, the seal of God is different. The seal verifies that the mobile genetic elements have been removed and that you have got new code to take the place and you are now safe to take into the new kingdom. That's the seal. Create in me a new heart. Yes, Psalms 51. So this creating a new heart, we don't spend enough time on this. Uh, people like Ellen White refer to it as imputing Christ's righteousness, and people don't know what that statement was, and they left it alone because, whew, what's, what does that mean? Well, this is, uh, you know, this is every bit as important. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, 
condemned sin in the flesh. And if you look at the Greek, it, it, he indicted it. He went in and he nailed it to the wall. That the righteous of, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And why do we say after the Spirit? Because the Spirit's the one who actually, under Christ's direction, does the rewriting. So whenever you see when Paul, or, or in the New Testament, when they talk about... Um, you, you have to have, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, the spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Remember that? A lot of people use that as a club to beat someone else if they don't buy, buy their theological uh, ideas. What Paul is really saying there is the spirit has to actually rewrite your circuitry in your brain so that you can comprehend these things. And if that hasn't happened, it, they, you, you won't. And that's why... The vast majority of people in the world today who have not been undergone have not undergone this think that what we're talking about today is absolute foolishness. Read First Corinthians chapter one. He goes through that. You, everyone in the world thinks we're nuts. We're absolutely off our you know our mental um, abilities are extremely compromised. And here's why: you have to have the, even the ability to comprehend these things has to be created in you so that you can even understand what's going on. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And we're going to come to that again in a little bit when we discuss grace versus works. But that's important. For sin, remember, that's the change in the genetic information system will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the as you were before, the straight genetic law, which, you know, the, what's in your cells, will, the enzymes there will take the information from the DNA and they will transcribe it and then translate it. The system works wonderfully. It's a marvelous system. But when you're under the law, that's what Paul's talking about. Because we have so much bad information in the, in the DNA, it's transcribing that and it's putting forth the enzymes and the other proteins which make us inclined to do the behaviors that are spoken uh, that we are prohibited from doing in the Ten Commandments. That's what means being under the law. And when you're under grace, what's happening? We're locking up the bad genetic information, but we're writing new. Could that also be then the law of sin? Yes, that's the same thing in, in Romans 7. 5, 6, and 7. If you just take this basic concept I've given you, now it's going to make sense. Before when I used to read it, at first the law is good, then it's bad, and, and he says the law should be followed, and then he goes, no, this, uh, this poor, wretched person that I am in Romans 7, uh, I'm under this law, uh, what, the, what I want to do, I don't do. If you take this approach and separate out that when he's talking basic law, he's talking about how genetics work, which he says is good, it's lawful, it's great. And then you add on, he will give you hints that when he's using the information that the devil has put in, that's what's causing the problem. And there's very little information that God's put in that's left, maybe 15% tops. And that's what he wants to work, that's what he wants to win, and who's going to liberate him from this, that's how he concludes in Romans 7. Faith, that part we must play which allows God to use his grace to heal the damage done by mobile genetic elements. Now, I, uh, Mark Twain used to give this illustration because he was not particularly um, sympathetic toward religion of any type. But he, would, he gave the story, he says a young boy went to church and the dad, father wanted to make sure that the boy really did go to church. So he said, what did the preacher talk on today? And the boy said... Uh, faith and the father said well what did the well, what did you come away with what was the take home message on faith and the boy says well faith is believing what you know ain't so and that is really uh, to it, that plagues Christian dumb today I've been in meetings where someone has come up bless their heart with something that's absolutely f way out there on the, some type of a religious um, jihad in their mind they've come up with some idea and the absolute, um, shall I say, the, the, it's extremely, extremely unlikely that their revelation has any basis in reality whatsoever. 
But the idea with everyone in the room was kind of, yes, yes, just have faith, just have faith. The idea is, is I'm willing to believe even the most bizarre, ridiculous idea just to prove to God that I've got faith. That's not faith. That gets you in with Jim Jones. That gets you in with David Koresh. That's the type of thing that's the most dangerous of all. Your faith and my faith should be based on evidence and fact, clear evidence and fact, not ambiguous evidence and fact, and not someone's idea of what it should be. And that's why I'm again saying to you, everything that I say, every paper that I quote, I give the reference up here on the screen. And the idea is for you to go back afterwards and check what I say. You should check what everyone says, but you should check what I say doubly. All right? Because if it's true, it will bear up under close scrutiny. If it's not, it's cyanide in the lemonade and you don't want to drink it. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So grace only works through faith, okay? God's got, grace is God's ability to not only sequester the mobile genetic elements, but to write new code. But in order for God to do that, we have to cooperate, and the word we use for that is faith. It's a general word. It's very broad. And he who doubts is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith. For whatever is not of faith is sin. We have only two modalities of operation just like we have two sets of circuitry in our brain, so this should not be a surprise, either what we do, say, and think is in line with uh, cooperating with heaven's rework of our genome, or it's not. There's no gray area. There's not, well, if I do this, I'm aiding God. If I do this, certain, uh, this set of things, I'm aiding the devil. But I've got this middle ground, which is neutral. That's me. There's no middle ground. There's no you. Either you've got you're working with God in his abilities to try to change you, or you're not. You are working against him. You are working with the other side, in which case you are aiding and abetting the increasing of mobile genetic elements, which are going to be displacing what God just wrote. So this is an ongoing, fluid environment. And you can I could put up... 20 papers from genetic literature which says that the genes are in constant flux, your DNA is in flux, it is not uh, etched in cement as we used to believe 40 years ago, the, your DNA is changing by the minute and as I remember as I told you a number of lectures ago that even different cells in the same organ of your body will have different a different genome so this is a very fluid thing but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Well, yes, if you aren't cooperating in heaven's extremely, uh, well, how, how do I put this? The information and the um, know-how that heaven is willing to, ex uh, to expend on yours and my behalf is of inestimable worth. It is, it, it, you can't put a price on it. And if you are not willing to cooperate to receive that, you won't. So what this text is saying is, you've got to do your part on this. This isn't something that's just bequeathed to you if you say, I believe in the Son of God and, I, and He is my way to salvation. That is not going to get you anywhere. And I hate to say that, and I know there's a lot of uh, different especially telev television evangelists who will tell you something completely different. But um, in my opinion, not only do they not have the Bible backing them up, but they don't have science either. So faith is very important because it is a prerequisite for God to work on our behalf. There are two aspects of faith. Believing that God can do what he says. This is done not only on the molecular level, which is not observable, but also on any level, including the macro levels. So, faith is believing that God is working on your genome. You can't see it, I can't see it. Even geneticists right now, would, even with all their sophisticated machinery to be able to follow what happens in the genome, probably couldn't follow it either. So, this part of it, you have to believe that what he says he can do, he can. 
because if you don't, you're not going to stay around for the, for the fixing. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Because the fixing isn't absolutely a, well, the fixing can be a very trying situation. Act on the behalf by, act on the belief by cooperating with God in his act of grace. In other words, you have ability to use in your thought system, in your brain, which, which set of circuitry you're going to use. The, the circuitry, the little circuitry that's left, which God has, which remains functional enough so that you can deal in an intelligent way with God. And the rest of the circuitry, which is, remember the talk we had on anapoloidy and the neur neurons, which is so... Um, changed that it is going to provide uh, data which is not uh, connected to reality. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that's God, he, God, was able to perform. That's talking, uh, Paul is talking in Romans here about Abraham and he's talking uh, about the uh, fact that Abraham was going to have a child. Abraham believed that God could do it. And further on in Hebrews, he, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, further on in, um, in Romans, he talks about the fact that, and in fact it might be here as I'm thinking about it, that he was convinced that if he, if he um, no, it's Hebrews 11, if he took ended up taking um, Isaac's life that God would resurrect him. He was convinced of that. He thought it through. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Remember we spent a lot of time on blood, microRNAs and, and exosomes and the whole thing. I'm not going to go through that again. Um, you've got to believe that what God is instituting in you and I through the Holy Spirit at a molecular level is real and that it works. Otherwise you aren't going to stay around for the finished product. And we're going to come to that in a minute. Why? How do we obtain faith? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. If you look it up in the Greek it really kind of means conviction. So it's the opposite of believing what you know ain't so. It's the opposite of someone coming up with a rather preponderant idea of what, the, what this text means and going, I believe, I believe, and everyone holding hands and say, just believe, brothers, just believe, sisters. It's the exact opposite of that. And when he has come, he will, and if you again look at the Greek, the word reprove is better translated convict. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And these are important things. Sin, changing God's information system, has gone on and it's a problem. Righteousness, there is a right way to do this and God can correct it. He can put the, the, the um, changes that the devil put into your information system, he can correct them and put it right. And judgment, that's what we're going to talk about in lecture 10 there's serious consequences if you don't get things put right. Very, 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 very serious consequences. And not because God's going to deliver them, they're cause and effect. I think of faith as this way. If you look at this uh, refueling jet up there, the mother jet, and you see the, um, the tanker is, uh, there's a fuel line that's going down to the fighter. That fuel line that's going down to the fighter is faith. And so where this analogy breaks down is the mother ship up there puts down, well, no, it's not. It's not breaking down at all. Because God has to convict us. The Holy Spirit convicts you of what is right, and that generates the faith in you. And the one that, uh, text that I just jumped over there where the disciples said to Christ, uh, you know, increase our faith. We don't have faith. Faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We, do, we can't even generate that much ourselves. That has to be given to us. And remember I talked to you about getting the circuitry in your brain so that you could even comprehend this stuff? Well, you need the circuitry to also have faith. 
We've had a major, major assault done on our brains and our brains, the, the information system in our neurons, neurons needs to be corrected and new circuitry needs to be formed. So this is the um, fuel line coming down is faith, but we've got to hook it up that if the, if the fighter jet underneath this tanker doesn't hook it up to the nozzle and start receiving the fuel, it's not, it's gonna, it, it's, it, it won't work. So we've got to hook up, and here's the key, and I'm gonna be saying this from the rest of the talk, we have to remain under that wing and we have to be receiving this stuff daily from here until Christ comes. Break away from the mother tanker and you're in trouble. You're gonna run out of fuel and you'll crash. Now here's the other problem in this little analogy. The devil has control over the winds and you're going to get buffeted like crazy to, to and, and the idea is going to be I better disengage from the, this refueling project because things are getting really bad and obviously things aren't going the way I thought they would and something's wrong here and I'm moving out. So the refueling it does not, is not a simple slam, slam dunk. It's contested by the other side severely contested and be expect that you're going to get buffeted around it's going to happen sanctification the finished work of grace but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they will be my people and here's the result this is the key and you're going to understand more next lecture in lecture 10 why this text is so very important. And they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Remember I said he signs it? He signs it. I have, this is my masterpiece. I have finished it. I am perfectly happy with this work. In fact, I'm proud of it. I'm going to sign my name to it. What happened when Moses asked to see Christ? Remember in uh, Exodus 33 and 34, he said, uh, Lord, I'd like to see you. And what did Christ said to him? You can't see my face and live. He says, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by you and you can see my backside. Remember that? And then next Next time we meet, we're going to talk more about why that's the case. But here is the point. If you have gone through the sanctification process, you will be able to look God in the face. And that is huge. That is huge. You don't know how many texts, because you probably have skimmed over in their Bible, that talk about the fact that our God is a consuming fire. And that we, in 1 Timothy 6, makes it very clear that you cannot approach him. You can't even get near him without experiencing very untoward effects like immediate death. When God is through with the sanctification process, you can look him in the face. But not until. And that's why the wicked, when he comes, run and ask for the rocks to fall upon them. But there's a small group who are running toward him and saying, this is our God, this is our God. Why are that small group able to run toward him at full speed, kicking up their heels, saying, he's here, he's here, don't you see, he's here, this is what we've been waiting for, when the vast, vast majority, 99.8% of the rest of the world is running away because they, they are willing to dive off of a cliff and die or be buried in a landslide of an earthquake than to continue to look at him. Huge difference there. From outward appearance, all of them are human beings. Why is there such a difference in behavior? That's next time we talk. Sanctification makes us fit for heaven, although we often put justification before sanctification. Sanctification is the road that one must travel to get to justification. Justification means that it is right that you should be there. And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So look how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 6.11. He says, you are sanctified and then you're justified. Here's the point. Justification means you have a right to be in heaven. You don't have a right to be in heaven until you've had all of this information, this erroneous information that we were saddled with and that we have aided and embedded and grown in our own uh, um, unique ways, removed. And new code written. And at that point, you don't fit in down here. You don't belong here. You belong up there. Because you are now a member of the kingdom of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. And your mind has to be remade. I exercised great restraint at this point. I had about seven texts I wanted to put in here. But as it is, we're going to have time troubles this morning. So I'm just trying to skip, to, to skim and hit the ideas. And at a later time, maybe we can delve into this more, more uh, thoroughly. Justification to show that to show one to be right or righteous provided provide evidence that one is fit for heaven. This term is often referred to as our title to heaven. It shows that we not only have a right to be there, but we belong there. Our information system and everything in within us is geared to work in that environment and is out of place in this one. Won't even function well in this one. who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Christ's resurrection, If we, it, it, I'm going to make a statement here that's going to at first sound off to you, but give me a chance to explain. Christ's resurrection is the most important fact in the Bible for you and me. Christ's resurrection is the most important fact for us. If we had to take one fact... It's his resurrection. Because if he wasn't, he came through. He took our, we spent a lot of time on this. He took our iniquities. He took our mobile genetic elements. He found a way to overcome them. And then he found a way to, on the cross, cross to remove them. And I'm going to show you there's already a, a number of ways that the Holy Spirit is actually writing code. It, this is my opinion. I can't prove that one. But there is there are, there is, let's put it this way, there, is capa there are capabilities in the cell to rewrite the DNA. And they're working in our DNA, in our cells today. It happens all the time. That's why I said the DNA is a dynamic process. It, it will, you can go to one cell today and come back in a month and the DNA will be markedly different. So, when Christ was raised, what happened? Remember? Two angels came from heaven, but there was a lead angel, and the lead angel we, we think was Gabriel, we don't know. But he had the glory of God, and it was so bright, and when he came in front of the tomb, the 300 soldiers that were watching, what happened? They were flattened. They were knocked literally on their, off their feet onto the ground. And there was an earthquake, remember that? And what did the angel do? He says, Father, I mean, he says... Um, Son of man, your father calls you. Arise. And Christ walked out, bathed in that glory. The same glory that's talked about in First Timothy 6, which says that the glory of God is uh, that no man can approach and live. He was bathed in it. If he had made a mistake, it would have been over, at least for his body. And I don't know what would have happened when you have God and you have God in human flesh, what, what would have occurred at that point? But let me tell you, the consequences would have been severe. If he had been left one little island of mobile genetic elements, the consequences would have been severe. So, this is the ultimate proof. He was able to withstand the absolute unfiltered glory 
that surrounds the Father and that he had. Remember he says, Father, in John, John 17, show them the glory that I had with you before the world began. Well, his was shrouded in humanity. But he was able to be exposed to that with no ill effects whatsoever. That means you and I have the same assurance because if we come to him, he will do the same thing for us. What does Paul say in Philippians? I wish that Christ be formed in you. And what this mind that is in Christ has to be in you. He is willing to do that for you and I so that when we are, get welcomed into the heavenly courts where this glory is everywhere, you don't need a sun there. It's, it's, it's the ultimate energy source beyond our wildest comprehension. We're safe. We have to buy gold tried in the fire. Revelation 3.18. We have to buy gold tried in the fire from him. And that's the problem with the Laodiceans. They're not coming to get gold tried in the fire. And I'm just going to make a blatant statement. We don't have time. I believe gold refers to proper information. He says, buy gold tried in the fire. I've got stuff that I have can prove to you can withstand any and all effects that are in the new kingdom. And you can get it from me, and only from me. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins, that's the removal, that are past, through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. That means that he is correct, and that he is the corrector or the justifier of him which believes in Jesus Christ. He's got the road map. It's the correct one. It is signed, sealed, and it has been proven without a doubt, demonstrated that it is perfect. And it can, whoever has this code can easily live in heaven and not only easily live there, thrive there. The energy which that surrounds the Father now which is lethal to us will become a source of absolute incredible invigorating energy boost once you have the right equipment to receive it remember clay and butter are both put outside and exposed to the sun on a summer afternoon in 90 degree weather 90 degree temperature. What happens to the clay and what happens to the butter? The clay becomes hardened and keeps its shape. The butter disappears and melts away. The energy isn't the key. It's the substance that the energy hits. By what evidence can God claim the right to declare humans righteous? Now, this is a big one because we don't have time, and this is fascinating, I would, if, if I were taking a lot of questions, someone would say, well, what happens to the person who dies before the sanctification process is complete? And I would argue that, yeah, probably the vast proportion of humanity is in that category. I know of Enoch and Elijah who weren't. I don't know of anyone else. Matthew 7, 1 says that we're not to judge to be not judged. So we're not to sit here and... and, and and agonize over who's going to be there and who isn't. We don't know why we don't understand genetics. We don't understand information. We have the most superficial understanding of this whole problem to begin with. We shouldn't be meddling in that. Don't do it. Waste of time. But there, how can God then take a certain select and we're going to talk about this next time. This is where the investigative judgment comes in. How can God take a certain select portion of humanity who is not completely realized the sanctified state to heaven and not take others who are also in the unsanctified state? Well, how does he choose which goes? And this is a very important question, and this is one that was put before, in my opinion, was put before the universe by the devil in the first place because he says, God's no judge of character. If he was, he'd see that I only have the best intentions and the best uh, motivations for what I do for his kingdom, and he is wrongly 
uh, he has wrongly maligned me as being an enemy of the kingdom when in fact he's jealous because I've got come up with better ideas that he didn't come up with and you know how those despots work they just want to get rid of anyone that might be competition to them oh but God did an experiment for us I love the way he provides evidence in the scriptures. Every one of the questions we can come up with here, there's evidence in the book. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although you moved, against, moved me against him. Now God is bringing up Job. The devil isn't. Remember, they're up there and the sons of God are meeting and the first, this was the second meeting. The first meeting, God brings up Job and the devil says to him, well, yeah, but you've got a fence around him. I can't get to him. And God says, okay, I'll take the fence away. And this is the second meeting. And God brings him up again and says, hey, how did, how did that work? Did Job, uh, did Job uh, were you able to break him down? And the devil uh, just uh, ignores the question and jumps right into the next part. And he says, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has will he give for his life. But put forth your hand now and touch his bones and flesh and he will curse you to your face. He says, you didn't let me touch him. I took away everything he had in one day. And that is very important in this argument and we're going to find out if I can get moving here why that was critical to this argument he took everything away from him one day and then Job comes and says yeah but you didn't let me touch him and he goes and he will curse you to your face and the Lord said to Satan behold he is in your hand but save his life okay how did this end up who won who won this bet God did. And Job was put under the most excruciating pressure to cave. Notice that the devil didn't pick that the devil well, the, well, notice the way the devil picked to do this. He didn't come down in, in, the, in his splendor because we're told in 2 Corinthians 11 that the devil can make himself into an angel of light even though he's probably far from that at this point in time, but he can, he can appear that way. He, he could have come and tried to intimidate Job, overpower him, maybe sit down and have an intellectual head-to-head -head with him. What did he do? He sent friends, and he sent the wife. When he wanted to look for the most lethal, effective way to get at Job, don't think that he just said, oh, let's see, what am I going to do today? I think I'll try the friends and the wife approach. Yeah, that sounds good. No, he was a student of Job, he, and he's a student of humanity, and he knows how best to get to us. How did he get to Adam? Through Eve. So what does he try to do to Job? What did Mrs. Job do? Why, she kept saying to him, curse God, die. You're a loser, you're done. Thank you for your help here. He's going to come after you and me the same way. It's his preferred route. A friend, relative, spouse. Oh, you don't believe that, do you? Oh, come on. Relax. Get off this stuff. That's far more effective than me up here, you know, waving my hands and preaching at you. When the devil really wants to get to you, that's where he's going to work. Be prepared for it. If you haven't experienced it, you will. Guaranteed. If you're under the idea of grace and faith. He will come after you. It will come. And it will come in the most ingeniously contrived manner that you can ever imagine and it will have an impact on you. What does Christ say? If you don't, if you it, that you have to forsake family mother, father, sister, wife everyone, if you want to get into the kingdom if you have a higher feeling for them than you do for me, you aren't going to be there. And he doesn't just say that because it sounds catchy because that's the way the devil's going to work 
amongst others, but that's you can be guaranteed he's going to work there. We don't have time to talk about this, but God's got a hedge around us, and we're going to find out, or talk about this a little bit later today. If he didn't, everyone in this room would have no chance. We'd be done. Yeah. If he's going to use friends and family against us, we need to be aware that he might use us against our, our that he might put it into our mind to say the wrong thing to friends and family. Yeah, I'm assuming, I'm trying to assume that all of us in this room aren't going to be uh, partaking of that. But you're absolutely right. And um, that's why it's incumbent upon us before we say any, anything to anyone to have checked things out every which way possible. Before I really became public with this, I spent eight years, and Dr. Webster, most of that eight years, probably all but two or three weeks of it, while he was being persuaded on his own, checking out this stuff, going at it over every single possible way before I would dare come out with something like this. So uh, th this is eight years of um, intense study. And I don't say I've got all the answers. I'm just saying I think there's enough here now that we need to talk about it. And you need to look this up. And I'm going to say this again. Don't trust what I say. Don't do it. What does Acts 17 say about the good Bereans? They went and checked out everything Paul said. They went right home from the synagogue that Sabbath morning and they went down and they got the scrolls out and they checked everything he said. And what is heaven says, that's good. And I say that's good. Because if I'm up here saying something that isn't correct and you're able to show it to me and you're able to show it in the Bible, I will be the first one up here the next Sabbath retracting it. I want no part of that. Okay, God's part to play in our sanctification. Now we're, we're going to change. We, we're done with definitions, and now we're going to look. What does God do in our sanctification? And then we're going to look at what we do in our sanctification. And then we're going to kind of get into some things about grace and works. He provides the power. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that was used in Christ's resurrection has to be used in us to correct these problems. This is a power-intensive procedure. And in Lecture 10, you're going to see just how intensive of a power procedure this is. It is huge. God is taking a huge drain of power to do this. It's not free, it's not simple, and it's not just simply rewriting code. It takes energy to do the rewriting and to do the sequestering. Lots of energy. You have 120 trillion cells in your body and you've got 3.2 billion DNA um, nucleotides sitting there in your uh, double helixes. That's a lot of work. He provides the know-how. This is probably the most important thing. Well, no, I'm sorry. They're all important. Forgive me. I can't. I cannot stratify them. If you don't have any one of the things, uh, the seven things I'm going to show you, you're not going to make it. So. But the know-how, let me put it this way, is what I find the most fascinating. Because that's where we can get a little idea of what's going on. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. See, I, I, I have alluded earlier that it's just throughout the Bible that our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12.29 Our God is a consuming fire to us. Now once we're changed, he's an energy source of unbelievable uh, um, uh, of unbelievable um, strength and it will never go out. So that's one reason we're going to live eternally. But it's a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. You know what fuller's soap is? That's uh, heavily lied soap that 
will take color out of your clothes. I mean, it it uh, it cleans. It's uh, so alkalotic it can. It, you should wear gloves if you try to use it. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Remember, we I told you that gold or gold and silver is talked about in the Bible, is I believe a euphemism for correct code. I can't prove that. I'm just if you go and read the text yourself and see how it fits, see what you think. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. What do we do with gold and silver? If we want to make it gold to a higher carat level, you put it through some pretty heavy heat to melt off the impurities or to, to divide off the impurities, don't you? That's what you do. And purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. What does Paul say in, in Romans 12, 1, that we are to make our bodies a living sacrifice? So let's put that in here, that they may, off, may, may offer to the Lord our bodies in that are right in righteousness. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. And he says here, he's going to write, correct? He's going to write it in our hearts, in our inward parts. Well, the only place I know that you can write is to, it would be to write code in the cells. I know of nowhere else that God could write something. But you can write code just like a programmer can, can write code for a software. And I will be their God and they will be my people. In other words, they and I can, can dwell happily ever after. Transposable elements in the epigenetic regulation of the genome. Overlapping epigenetic mechanisms have evolved in eukaryotic cells to silence the expression and mobility of transposable elements. I want you to, I'm going to read that part again. This is, if you're going to hear anything I read on this slide, this is the more, this is the take home message. Overlapping epigenetic mechanisms, that means that more than one, have evolved in eukaryotic cells. Let me just addend, make an addendum for us here today. God has placed in the cell instead of evolved. To silence the expression, okay, that means that if it's transcribed, and mobility, remember they jump between chromosomes, um, of transposable elements. Okay, so there are multiple things within the cell that are working against mobile genetic elements, just directly. TEs have served as building blocks for epigenetic phenomena both at the level of single genes and across larger chromosomal regions. In other words, they've infested everything and they work at all levels, whether it's a chromosomal level or even at the protein coding level or even below that. In addition, new insights have been gained into how, I'm sorry, uh, important progress has been made recently in understanding these silencing mechanisms. In addition, new insights have been gained into how this silencing has been co-opted to serve essential functions of the host cell, highlighting the importance of transposable elements in the epigenetic regulation of the genome. If I had to just have you read one paragraph about mobile genetic elements, and I had to use that paragraph to make every, all the other points I've made, it would be this paragraph. And I want to point out that this has been out since 2007, so it's not something that just is off the press. Everything, um, I, I, there is so much that we could talk about here, and we don't have time, but even the quantum spin on the mo micro RNAs for those of you who are sciencely inclined, there are multiple quantum spins on the electrons and on the protons and neutrons in the, in the actual molecules of the microRNA themselves. And it changes the way they interact with the DNA, which also has quantum spin. And this is in a way, a piece of information we had no idea about before two months ago when I read it. Now, 
they don't divide between God and the devil, but they show six different uh, molecules of microRNAs with different quantum spins. And I'm going to tell you that may be, this is a guess, I don't know, the way that the body is able to tell which is foreign DNA and which was the original. It gets down to that level. The, the quantum spin on the microRNAs that come from the devil have a different spin. This is, again, my assumption. I can't prove this. But there are evidence that suggests that what I'm telling you is true. They have a different spin than gods do, and they do different things, and they do things which destabilize the DNA and st instead of edify it, which the other microRNAs do. This is just a new level of information and I suspect we have 99.99% unknown areas to mine. So do you understand? When, when we're talking about DNA now, we're not just talking about the four different base pairs, the nucleotides, the four different nucleotides. This information goes far, far deeper. It goes down to the atom and probably will go down to subatomic product particles. <clears throat> Intrinsic immunity against retroposons by apobac, I call it, cyanidine deaminase. I am not going to go into this. I've gone too far. I've spent time already on this topic just now on other things. Uh, and I don't have time to spend a lot of here just to say this that this APOBEC is capable of changing a, um, a cytosine into a thymine. Okay? There's another um, we talked about microRNAs already. I guess I should stop for a second. The APOBEC enzyme, if I can change a thymine, a cytosine into a thymine, I'm rewriting code. I've changed, for instance, a, a letter A to a letter B in that code. And there's another uh, set of enzymes which change a guanine into an adenine. All right? So there's only four letters in the alphabet, and all four can be changed by these enzymes. And where do these enzymes primarily work? I'm, I'm, I'm now just going to summarize. I'm retro elements on mobile genetic elements. The, in fact, we don't know of any incidences per se when they don't work on mobile genetic elements. We can't say that's the only place they work, but that is the place that we have found that they work. They're rewriting code. They're rewriting code in your cells and in my cells as we speak. And I would suggest to you, and again, no proof on this whatsoever, who do you think is telling those enzymes what to write? Because, uh, you know, they could, uh, where they change the code is extremely important in how they change it. If it's just by chance, we wouldn't be here. You'd mess up the code and we'd be done. We'd be gone. Who's telling these enzymes where to make the change? Who's instructing them? Who's got the intelligence to do that? We talked about microRNAs before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just flashing this up. We talked at length when we talked about Christ's blood and, and we talked about uh, sexual improprieties in uh, looking at the seventh commandment. So I'm not going to go through microRNAs again. What is the result of this? What is the result? Remember the microRNA is important for getting the Mobile genetic elements sequestered into the heterochromatin. Remember that? So I will remind you on that one. So the microRNAs are important in the silencing part. And those two enzymes that I talked about, enzyme families, are important in the rewriting part. So that covers both of the things that we need to have done. We need to have the old, old, cold, old, old code sequestered and prepared for burning destruction. And we have to write new code. And I've showed you both that the cells have intrinsic, clearly, 
de demonstrated with multiple papers that the cells are doing both of those procedures right now. So I can't tell you that it is the Holy Spirit that is at work in both of those camps. I don't know that. There's no scientific paper that could ever show that. But I don't have to show that to make this paradigm have legs. I just have to show you that there, that there is that, those two functions are ongoing in the cell right now. That's all I have to do to, to, to um, keep this paradigm moving. What is the result then when you rewrite code and when you, sequest when you sequester the bad code and you rewrite new code? What is the result? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a servant. The Greek word is dolos which means slave. I don't know exactly why the King James translators chose servant, but dolos is most of the other times it is used in the New Testament, it is translated slave. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And what happens to the... The truth will make you free. What happens to slaves? They're freed. What happens, Christ, what about Isaiah 61.1 where it talks about the humanity is in the prison house and that someone is coming to, to let us free. It's Isaiah 42 talks about that. That we are prisoners. That the de and, and in Ezekiel 28 it says, is this the being that would not let his prisoners go? Would not release his prisoners? When you are sinning, and, and again, I'm sorry I have to be very general here because we don't have time, but I will make a categorical statement. At some future date, we'll sit down and you can. I, I'll defend my position. All sin is addicting. When it gets to a point where it becomes what, how we d d define addiction, which is um, uh, uh, Drug-seeking behavior, for instance, uh, there, there's seven categories, uh, seven usually lists that they look at to determine whether you're addicted. And um, the reason why the addiction is so lethal is because I was just reading a paper this last week um, about the fact that it suppresses something called LTD, long-term depression, uh, in the hippocampus and in the amygdala of the brain what it does is it depresses input from the prefrontal cortex and the cortex and it depresses it to the point where it no longer gets through. So the part of your brain that says no, 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 I don't want to go take some more heroin, it's destroyed my life, becomes in essence a shouting sound that your brain ignores and it goes right along with the drug seeking behavior to the point where it even can in, um, endanger your life and you still will do it. And, it, the, and, and the, the, what they were seeing in this paper is that they feel that that change in circuitry, that shutting down the input from the prefrontal and the frontal cortex is permanent. Now, I disagree with them because we've got someone who can write code. We've got someone who can take away code, who can write new code, who can reestablish those circuits. Is it any wonder why things like AA are more successful at getting people off of alcoholics than, than other uh, modalities which don't incorporate a, a higher force? This is lethal stuff in, it, in what it sets down, what these mobile genetic elements will do to your brain and my brain will render us, if we don't go to God for help and stay under there, will render us enslaved robots completely dictated by our surroundings, our environment. Show a strong a, a cocaine addict some cocaine on, uh, you know, on the table and they will go over and uh, uh, they'll imbibe. Or they'll pick it up and wait till you leave the room and they'll take it, even if they've sworn off. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission. If you look at the Greek, it's release from bondage of sin. Sin is addictive. Sin will take away your free will. 
it will restrict and eliminate your ability to make a choice. He promises not to overwhelm us while doing his work. There is no temptation taken you, but such is a common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Remember I said I referred to the fact that um, Job got everything in one day? Uh, I'm going to get to a paper in a minute. We'll tell you why. We can't handle that. We don't have enough bandwidth in our brain to handle that much um, information that requires decision making on our part. We simply will abdicate after a certain point in time and not, and not only not, our decision making no longer is cognitive, it becomes emotional, emotive, emotional in nature. And then when you're down there, you're going to be making decisions which um, many times have nothing to do with reality. He promises that he will not destroy who we are in the process. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We covered this already. There is no cases which are beyond his ability to correct. Why is he able to save them to the uttermost? The Greek word means to, to completeness or to perfection. That come to him, to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession. And the word intercession here, I, was grow, I grew up believing that the word intercession means that he would go to God and somehow talk God into accepting us. You know, Bob's not that bad of a guy. Please, he's really, he's, good, he's got good qualities. Please, can't you just overlook uh, X, Y, and Z here and let's let him in. Please, please, look, look, here's what I've done for him. I've died. Come on, that's got to have something to do. As if God, ha Christ has to plead with the Father. Nothing could be further from the case. If you go read John 6, well, let's start with John 3, 316. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. God sent Christ. Why would he send Christ on an errand and then have Christ, after completing the errand, go, well, I don't know if I'm going to accept what you did. Uh, well, you're going to have to talk me into it. John 6 says, uh, Christ says, I came to do my Father's will, not my own. He sent me down here, and, and what he sent me to do was, I was to come up with a plan of salvation so that whoever comes to me will be saved, will be raised on the last day. God sent him on the mission. Why would God send him on a mission and then once he's completed it at a great personal cost go, well, I don't know. You're going to have to talk me into this. They're both on the same side. The intercession is not between Christ and God, the Father. It's between Christ and us. He's interceding um, between for us to to bring us into the fold and say, listen, you've got a terminal condition. We need to talk. And the intercession means, if you look at the Greek, a spe um, to go to or meet a person, especially for the purpose of conversation, consultation, or supplication. Christ is, he, knock, he says, I stand at the door and knock. He's always ready and willing. He wants to come in and he wants to talk with, he wants to talk with us. That's the intercession part. He wants to intercede with us. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. I've already covered this, alluded to it earlier, when we talked about how the genome is so different between you and me, and there's even difference between the same cells and the same organ of our body. Why did I put this text up? As a reminder that what God came up with on our behalf had to be able to take care of all the multiple combinations and permutations that you can have with 3.2 billion base pairs and then when you add on the who knows how many microRNAs and other type circular RNAs and there's all there's the number of epigenetic modalities is just beyond count. He had to come up with a way for each of us. We both have the same disease, but we all have a different manifestation of that disease, and he had to come up with a cure for every one of the manifestations. And that's a lot. That's a whole lot. That is incredible. This statement is mind-boggling. The numbers become so large that it simply almost becomes meaningless when you think you have 120 
trillion cells, and they all have a little bit different. Re uh, um, uh, they, they, the disease presents a little bit different in all of them and they all needed to be taken care of and now you count how many people on the planet right now that are alive which have approximately the same number of cells and you begin to get the magnanimity of the situation. He will finish the job if you let him. Being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, as long as you're there what, like faith and you're receiving the grace from the mothership, he will continue working. The only person that can call off the operation is you and me. He will not call it off. He will not call it off even if you've stumbled and fell 50 times or 70 times 7. Shop is open. What does Paul say? Forgetting those things which are behind, I now strive toward the high calling of Christ Jesus Philippians 3 that's got to be our view we're going to the winds that are buffeting us as we're under that mother tanker taking in the grace are severe enough that it is going to knock off the hose the, the nozzle that's delivering the grace and we've got to go back and hook it back up again no one's going to get by without that happening nobody The Holy Spirit does the work under Christ's direct supervision. However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, this is Christ talking, and shall show it to you, or give it to you. That's another way of putting it. So the conduit, the person, or the, the, the entity, the, the intelligence that takes what Christ is, and I, I picture Christ now in the, in the most holy place up there, I, I, I picture this as a command center because he is fighting untold millions of battles at one time in all of the humanity that is praying and talking to him because these they're contested territory, the other side is fighting for them too. He's carrying on this incredible war. And that's the command center. And so the Holy Spirit is what implements the battle plan. And he's equated with each one of us. Think about that. Uh, you know, we could just... I'd love to stop and go through all of the different things, uh, the different um, implications of this, but we just don't have time in whom all, you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The Spirit's the one that actually implements the game plan that's drawn up by Christ in the most holy place. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed. Sealed is order to prove, the, Dr. Small, to confirm or to, to attest. You're sealed, you're, you're proven, you're tested. If you put uh, the the mints put a seal on when they put coins out these collector coins they will put a seal of a, that that they are saying it is 99.99999 percent pure that's what we're talking here and I'm going to jump down and says but whoever and this is Matthew 12 uh, 31 to 32 but whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world nor in the world to come. The first part of the uh, text, Christ says, you know, you can, you can say bad things about me, and that's not the end. But if you grieve away the Holy Spirit, I've got no other way to deal with this problem that you've got in, the, in your information system. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can implement what I say should be done. And if you take away the implementer, nothing will get implemented and you're done. And next time we meet, we're going to talk about the unpardonable sin, which is really what this is referring to. And why is it unpardonable? Because you don't want pardon anymore. What is the goal of sanctification? In delivering us from sin, it is not enough that we shall be saved from the sins that we have actually committed we must be saved from committing other sins. And that this may be so, there must be met and subdued 
this hereditary liability to sin. We must become possessed of a power to keep us from sinning, a power to conquer this liability, this hereditary tendency that is in us to sin. I'm quoting A.T. Jones, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, a book, an article. We know that whoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches, now the Greek word really means to fasten oneself to, adhere to, cling to, and so that the wicked one touches him not. Now let's just really, let's do a quick little um, uh, exercise here. Okay, in delivering us, I'm sorry, we know that whoever is born of God sins not. That means that person is not using, is not allowing the devil through unauthorized means to change the information system. See that? And how would that occur then? Because that he, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself. In other words, you remain, your integrity, your information system remains, the integrity of your information system remains. It's not, it's not uh, sullied. How? Because when the wicked one comes to get you to engage in either thought or action, which would open up that part of the genome and allow those mobile genetic elements to thrive, thrive and go, grow, what do you say? You go, no, I'm not at all interested. The devil finds no niche to grab onto you and get your attention and get you to talk to him and the next thing you know you're following what he wants to say. You are to a place where his temptations don't tempt you anymore. And how do we know that's the case? What did Christ say at the end of John 14? He says, the evil prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. And he says that the day before he goes to the cross. In other words, we're done. I have finished segregating all the mobile genetic elements and I have got them thoroughly silenced so that when the wicked one comes and tries to get me to use circuitry in my mind that would promote me to work and do what he wants me to do, that circuitry is shut down. There's nowhere for him to light on and to... And to uh, uh, get into, if you will, get into my mind and get me working in his way. This is perfection. This is what we are to aim for and this is what the 144,000 will have accomplished. Talked about in, Roman, I mean in uh, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Talks about the 144,000. They will have done this. If they will have done this, that means that it's doable. And I think we are, I think God's taking reservations in that 144,000 right now. He's looking for applicants. And like boot camp, you're going to have to be put through boot camp. But like anyone uh, in that's in the military that goes ahead and becomes a Navy SEAL, that when, when they have made it, they, uh, the sense of accomplishment and what they have done is well worth the effort. I got to spend a little time here because, um, well, because I think I need to. Grace versus works. When I was growing up, I can tell you right now, it was all works. I was in a point where um, at the end of the day, bless my mother. Uh, mother's memory. She was a wonderful mother and she was did what she absolutely thought was uh, right and I have no nothing but admiration for her but she would say, you, Bobby you need to think about what sins you committed today and you need to um, we, we need to, before going to bed we need to have prayer and you need to ask for forgiveness and so I would just say uh, Lord forgive me for all the sins I made uh, and I would jump into bed because in South Dakota it was minus 30 and our house didn't have good insulation and it was cold but I feel, and some nights I would jump in and I hadn't said that and I'd be going to sleep and I'd say oh by the way forgive me for all the sins I made today uh, so that I got that covered okay no mention was about the sins that I wanted to do and would have done if the circumstances was right and I didn't do. I got credit for not doing those. Under that system, if you really wanted to do something and you held back for whatever reason, you got credit. 
Right there, that should be ringing danger bells in your mind after what we've gone over. You're using wrong circuitry, and you would let that circuitry play out except for circumstances. All right, and the gray side, we've gone, the, there's the other side of the ditch, and that ditch says, doesn't matter. He's going to take care of it all. Yes, you should be good if you can, but if you're not, no problem. In a twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed, and all this, these problem areas in your personality are just going to disappear. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 52, which is their one of their bulwark texts. Who exemplifies works? Pharisees. And they were proud of it. There was no problem with them. They were very uh, proud of what they had done. And their, their outward behavior was impeccable. But what did Christ say about them? You are white sepulchers. You've been, you're a tomb of dead bones, and w which to the Jew was the anathema, was the absolute worst description of filth. You've got whitewash on the outside, but inside you are filthy. Why? Because what they were doing on the inside, for instance, is they were planning to murder Christ. At the same time, they were apparently doing all the outward stuff that looked okay. What about grace? Well, we have the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? Well, if you read in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, it will talk about the seven deacons that were ordained in the early church, Philip was one, uh, Stephen was another, and another one was Nicholas of Antioch, who it says was a proselyte. Wh what is a proselyte? A proselyte is a individual who was a uh, pagan, was converted to Judaism, and then went from Judaism to Christianity. And that ends up being very important because he is credited with, uh, well, they call them the Nicolaitans. He was credited with starting an idea of religion where he borrowed heavily from Gnosticism, and Gnosticism also had its uh, foundations in uh, paganism. And the idea was is that bits of God broke off and came to this earth and were encapsulated in human flesh, and human flesh is, is, is dirty and demeaning and the human flesh was created by a lesser God who also created this world. So everything in this world is contaminated. Our bodies are contaminated. And the whole idea is to get this part of you that's God back up out of this sewer of a mess and get it back up with God. And the way you did that was through knowledge. And that's where Gnosticism is to know. And the idea is you were saved through knowledge. Okay? And on the idea was is that you just had to buy into this and then you would be initiates and you'd keep moving up. Well, what the Nicolaitans did is they borrowed part of that and then they added some Christianity together. And what they said was, what you do in your body really doesn't matter. It's going to be shed anyway. It's like a cocoon. It's like a, uh, a, a caterpillar goes through and uh, goes into a cocoon and comes out a moth. It's, you're, you're going to metamorph. You're going to be taken to heaven and this body and, and this world is all going to be destroyed. So it doesn't matter what you're going to do. It's going to be taken care of anyway. And specifically, Christ talks about this in Revelation 2, verses, uh, I believe it's 6 and 18, where he says, I hate the Nicolaitans. They, they, their big thing was they loved to have big feasts which turned into sexual origins. And they got drunk. Because it didn't matter what you did in this body, it had no implication at all. Now, that's 180 degrees from what you've been hearing here, isn't it? For the last, what, 10, 12 weeks? It's exactly the opposite. Everything you do in this body is vitally important because it's the information system that's going to heaven. And that is from the foundation of this world. So, uh, works with the Pharisees has often been called legalism and under grace. Well, they say, and I already quoted you one of those, that you are, uh, Ephesians 2 8, you are no longer, um, you are saved through faith, by grace through faith, um, as a gift of God, and not by works, so that no man would glory. That's one of their main texts. We're going to be coming to some others in a moment. I, there's about eight or nine of them, and I don't have time to, to, to put them all up. Um, but the bottom line is, 
that you're no longer under the law, you're under grace, which means doesn't matter. Yes, you should try to do what's right because in the end you're going to be happier. But if you don't get the job done, no problems. It'll be taken care of at the end anyway. Now, the grace people point a figure at the uh, works people and they say, you're legalists. But the truth of the matter is, both are legalists because they both find a legal um, answer to the problem. They both use a legal model to come to their final endpoint. If it's the works people, they say, yeah, if you work and you're able to control your behavior and you get it with close enough so that you're accept you've been deemed that you have kept the law, you're in. The grace people say, oh, no, 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 that's totally ridiculous. What you have to do is to have a knowledge and a, a, a knowledge and, a, and agree to what God is going to do. And then after that, Christ is like a defense attorney who goes in and, and plea bargains uh, your case. And in the process, let's say he plea bargains and says you have to do 400 hours of, um, uh, of uh, working for the public. He comes out of the plea bargain. He says not only all you have to do is admit you did something wrong and I plea bargain 400 hours of public service, but don't worry, I'm going to do that for you, so you're free to go. Okay? That's how the two set themselves up. And the reason why the grace now is the one that's everywhere is because what could be easier? But when they say works, if you really try to nail down both sides, they'll admit to you it's effort. So what the grace people are saying is you can be saved with minimal effort. And the works people say, no, you're saved with lots of effort. And if the grace people say, oh, no, no, you're, you, you are talking works here, remember, the grace, unless you are a universalist, you are works oriented. Now, what do I mean by that? A universalist says everyone's saved no matter what. Even if they don't do anything, even if they curse at God, at the end, they're all, everyone's going to be saved. The grace people do, usually, if you talk to them, they say you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've got to profess faith in Him and in His sacrifice on the cross. The minute they say that, the minute that's a prerequisite, that's work. It's work in any scientific laboratory in the, in the world. You've done chemical work in your brain. So when the, when the grace people say that they're not works oriented, yes they are. You have to do work. You have to accept Jesus Christ and put, put forth the thought or the statement that you're doing that and that's work. What they are is they're minimalists. They're minimalists on the work side. Whereas the legalists are maximalists on the work side. But I'm going to suggest to you something else. Well, let's read about grace here. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans appears to have been a form of antinomianism, which makes the fatal mistake that man can freely partake in sin because the law of God is no longer binding. It held the truth on the gratuitous, it, hold, it held the truth on the gratuitous reckoning of righteousness. But suppose that a mere intellectual belief in this truth had a saving power. Today, the doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made God's law of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned in the book of Revelation. This is from Theopedia, which is on the web. I thought they did a very good job of synopsizing it. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is their one of their main key texts. The other is uh, Ephesians 2.8. So if you just take that out of context, you go, well, maybe they've got a point. But let's go ahead and read the next verse. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forget bid. They leave that one out. They stop at 14. They don't go to 15. They don't add 15 in. And I had four other verses I was going to do that with. The very next, the Ephesians uh, 2, 8 uh, and 9 uh, are the ones they quote, but you go read t Ephesians 2, 10. It talks about having to do, what, that you have to do something in this process. So they, they, they conveniently, in my opinion, conveniently leave out 
the very next texts which clarify the statement. And if, I ta if I'm allowed to take any one of these statements out of context, I can make the Bible say anything I want to. I mean, I can say, uh, you know, that... Um, uh, uh, that uh, the Israelites rose up to play and that they uh, around the Mount Sinai and that they were uh, busy in fornication and then I can take another text that says go thou and do likewise we can put those two together and I can say then the Bible is all for fornication context is everything you've got to read the whole chapter what's before and what's after not here a little bit and there a little bit what part of grace, well this is what I've, I've had them come to me before, what part of grace do you understand? It's all grace, period. Done. And they quote Ephesians 2.8. That under, you know, that uh, through faith, grace through faith are you saved not of your own and not of works lest any man should boast. That's the end of the argument. We don't want to hear any more. Well, what about this text? Then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. How do you explain that text in light of Ephesians 2.8 if you're going to make 2.8 stand by itself or you're going to make Romans 6.14 stand by themselves? But what about this text? So you have also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Works. Well, we've just picked on grace. Now let's go look at works. This is the this is the the works people. Although there are very few of them left, this is the text they're going to take you to. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son on the altar? See you how faith worked with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. In other words, if you really want to have faith, you've got to work. Faith comes after you've pretty much got yourself totally following the law. You got to pick yourselves up by the bootstrap, man. Get some, uh, get some mental toughness. Come on. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this: to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, affliction, which the grace people like to quote up to that part, and then they stop because guess what the next one says? And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, well, that means there's effort involved there. Why is works absolutely doomed to failure? Well, this one we can go to science. Um, findings from the two experiments suggest that if processing resources are limited, spontaneously evoked effective reactions rather than cognitions tend to have a greater impact on choice. As a result, the consumer is more likely to choose the alternative that is superior on the effective dimension but inferior on the cognitive dimension. Okay, this is the paper. I'm putting this out there. That was gobbledygook. Now let me tell you what they were talking about. I'm quoting from the Times, which was quoting this paper, so I thought they could probably do it more succinctly than me. For dieters, now let me start with this. Um, they took a group of dieters, people who are dieting. And they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have you remember either one group was told to remember two digits in order, and the other group, which was the experimental group, were told to remember seven digits, like a phone number. Okay? And then what they did is they brought them into another room and they had pieces of chocolate cake on one table and they had salads on another table with locale dressing. And they said, while we're in here, why don't you guys get something to eat and then we're going to go on to the next part of the experiment. Well, this was the experiment. The people who were asked to remember seven digits, 50% more of them, here it says, those with the uh, ate the chocolate cake than the people who were only asked to remember two digits. This is what we're talking about as bandwidth. 
the people who had to remember seven digits, part of their brain was working on remembering those seven digits, and it took more work than remembering two. And so because part of their bandwidth in their brain was working on trying to remember that, they had less to work with making other decisions. And when the cognitive part is overworked, the brain, are, by default, goes to the emotional, which is from the amygdala, to make the decision. And guess which one the amygdala is going to choose? That's the emotional one. Give me the cake. Okay? Now, how does this have to do with works? All the devil has to do is do what he did to Job. Start lining up. Well, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's move to the next one. The mental strain of making do with less. In this article, which was by the Times, they did another interesting thing. They brought into the room an uh, equal number of dieters and non-dieters, okay? Six and six. And into the room, they said, okay, we are going to be, uh, we're going to give you a small seminar on, on topic X, and at the end, there'll be a small quiz. We want to see how well, how effective we were in getting this information across to you. And as this person is describing what they're going to do, someone walks in with two platters of freshly baked chocolate, chocolate chip cookies. The aroma fills the room and just puts it on the table. Some of the people ate the cookies and some didn't. But here, that's not what they were looking at in this experiment. What they looked at was how much they retained at the end of the lecture. And the people who were dieters, whether they ate the cookies or not, did, infinite, did markedly less well on the exam than those who weren't dieting. Why? The ones who weren't dieting didn't care about the chocolate chip cookies, and if they had one, they didn't give it another thought. The dieters were thinking, now, if I eat these, these cookies smell awfully good. If I eat one, maybe if I go to the gym today, no, let me figure out the calories. How am I going to get, how am I going to make up for this? They were so busy doing that, they couldn't concentrate on the presentation, and they didn't remember a significant part of it. Let's go to one more. And I'm just going to quote this. In four laboratory studies, some participants made choices among consumer goods or college course options, whereas others thought that the same options, thought about the same options without making a choice. Okay? One group was told they had to make a choice that they were going to be graded on, and, and they had different mental tasks to do. That's the experimental group. The control group was just told about the, the different options, and they were not forced to make a decision uh, in this experiment. Making choices led to reduced self-control, less physical stamina, reduced persistence in the face of failure, more procrastination, and less quality and quantity of arithmetic calculations. Um, going down, further, studies suggest that choosing is more depleting than merely deliberating and forming preferences about options and more delete, depleting than implementing choices made by someone else. If I ask you to make some important decisions after you've made a couple of them, you become less able to make further ones. The cognitive starts wearing out, and then guess what's waiting? The default is also always the emotional, the amygdala and the hippocampal area. And it's, it's more depleting if I ask you to make the decision versus just listen to the options. And it, it, it even goes deeper than that. It says that even if I tell you what to do, I say, here are the options, now I want you to do this, that's not nearly as depleting as if you have to make the decision. Here's the key. And this is why God says, I will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. If he, the devil can overwhelm our bandwidth and would do it in a heartbeat. And he, he, over, he overloaded Job's. God says, I'm not going to keep you from overloading Job's bandwidth. I know him this well. He will not let me down. Which means under the most egregious conditions, Job held firm. Bless his heart. When we get to the kingdom, he's one of the people I want to talk to. There, we talk about uh, um, uh, Daniel. We talk about, you know, in the lion's den, and well, we should. And we talk about, especially Joseph. Man, what happened in Potiphar's home with his wife? These are incredible. But none of them were tested. 
to the level that Job was, not even Abraham. Job lost his kids. Abraham was threatened with loss. Job lost them. He lost everything he owned in one day. You want to talk about overload? You want to talk about over, overpowering his bandwidth? And then we, do, we have other, uh, well, I'm gonna, I know it's late, but I'm going to give you one other paper anyway. This was where the people first came up with this idea, came out of Israel, and what they found out was they had people doing proba that were probation officers, and they would come in, and prisoners would be brought in, and they found that uh, the first hour from 8 to 9, about 50% of the prisoners who were, came in for probation got granted probation, but by the time you got to 11 to 12, less than 10% did. And starting at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, when they reconvened, 50% again in the first hour were given probation, and by the time you got to 4.30, none were. And it was repeated that way day after day, and they started saying, there's something here. And so they went ahead and looked at it, and that's when they came up with something called decision fatigue. That making all of these decisions depleted the brain's ability to make further ones. And the ways you can counteract that is to sleep. That's why you shouldn't make your decision unless you've slept. But the other way is to eat something to re and to stop what you're doing and to get nourishment High, something with a high glucose content and then that in a way counteracts it. If you're a legalist, you can't do it. The only way you may think you've gotten by with it is because the devil hasn't been allowed to come after you with any type of vigor and the minute he does you're done, you're toast. There is no way you'll make it. He will overwhelm your bandwidth, you will go to your amygdala and hippocampus and you will make the wrong decision. Guaranteed. There is no way that can work, period. Breaking God's law has nothing to do with legal pronouncements. That's where both of them are wrong. They're looking for a legal answer to a physical problem. It has everything to do with reaping consequences. Just like an experiment, when you add different reagents and you get different products. That's what we're talking here. If you're a chemist and you want to put together uh, uh, two, uh, a base and an acid, and you're going, you know what's going to happen when you do that, poof. It has no, you can't say to yourself as you're mixing them, you can't say, but I forgive you. Everything is fine. This is no problem. I'm going to put both of you together, and you're going to get along, and there's not going to be a mini chemical explosion. Everything's going to be fine. You can say that all you want, and there will still be that explosion. There is no rule or sleight of hand that's going to get you from cause from effect and that's what we're de dealing with here in information theory and specifically in genome is we're dealing with an information problem and it's cause and effect and therefore it's got to be cleaned up in a cause and effect way and it doesn't matter whether God likes you or not he loves us all we're told in first Timothy 2 5 that he wants I mean 2 4 that he wants everyone to be saved so if it was just on his druthers to, to, you know, who does he want in the kingdom? Everyone would be included. Is everyone going to be there? No. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will reap. God does not get into between the sowing and the reaping and say it doesn't matter if you, if you believe that Christ is the Lord and he died on the cross, you, you are exempt from cause and effect. There's no addendum to that text. For sin pays its wage death, but God's a free gift of eternal life. Sin does the pain. Sin does, you die because of sin, not because of God. And we're going to see that in the, when we meet on January 11. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Remember we talked about this in lecture one, and I said that was very important. The changes made to your information system down here on this earth are permanent. They will be, they're transportable up into eternity. You are, today, you and I are making who we are going to be for eternity. And the shop is open and God says, I've got all the power in heaven and earth. Christ says, and I can do anything you want. Let's sit down and meet. Let's remake you. How do you want to be remade? And of course, all of our first answers, we want to be like you. He says, absolutely, that's where we're going to start. But what else would you like? 
the, the, the heaven storehouse is open. It's complete. We, and the most important thing, the most valuable thing, the only valuable thing you can ever get is code. And he's got all kinds of code writing capabilities. Now that code writing capabilities is going to be turned off for sure at the end of probation, but certainly when you die, you're, that code writing capability is gone. So while we have this chance, why wouldn't we take it? And if the enemy on hear my words, believe not. Notice Christ says, I judge him not. Now in, in, in uh, John 12, he says that the Father uh, doesn't judge you, I judge you. And you ought to read this, John uh, 12, and then read John 8, and then read, read John 5, and then read John 3, where it all talks about judgment. And it happens to be backwards in sequence, in sequence, but if you read them, you'll get a very good idea of exactly what's going on. We're in John 12 here. He says, I judge not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. Okay, then what is it that judges? This is Christ, who God the Father says, I've given, Christ says he's given all judgment to me. So, okay, what's the judge saying now? What is the judge telling us? The judge tells us, he says, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Remember we talked in the first lecture about God's word being reality? Remember we, we talked about... Um, Aristotle's definition of truth was that which is, and we talked about the word, you know, thy word is truth, and uh, John 17, and we went, we went that Christ is the word, Christ is reality, God, state, God can't lie because everything he states becomes reality. So that's why Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. He can't. Anything he states becomes reality. Whatever he speaks, he speaks the world into existence. So um, what he says is, Reality will be your judge. Reality is going to be your judge. I'm not going to, you know, the idea, and we're going to get into this next time, of that God's sitting up there with all these lists of sins, and he's checking to say, did they ask for forgiveness? Oh, here we've got one. Nope, no ask for forgiveness. Oh, oh boy, let's put that out over here. How many of these do we have? And, oh, we're over 100 now. That means in the danger zone. And let's keep, ah, 250, we're done. Close the books. <coughs> He is not the taskmaster that's up there going through the books trying to find a reason to keep you out. The other side wants you to believe that. But usually what the other, well, every time the, what the other side wants you to believe, it's 180 degrees away from what's true. For every one that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deed may be manifest. That's another way of saying when Christ comes, though the bright light, brightness of his coming, there's a small group that are running toward it, and there's a vast number that are running away. And we've already discussed, and we're going to discuss in detail next time around, why from a genetic point of view that happens. But we judge ourselves. We segregate ourselves. God doesn't sit there and go, let me see now. I've got, I've got a bunch more names to go through here. Just hold it, folks. We're going to be separating you. We're going to get you into your right area. He doesn't have to. We go to which side we're supposed to be on, and we do it voluntarily. So there can be no mistake that somehow with all these billions of people that God gets someone wrong. Ah, five mistakes. Ah, I've got them on the lost side. They should be on the safe side. And we've got five on the safe side that needs to be on the lost. Ridiculous. And we're going to see next time that we, in essence, judge ourselves. Because we're in on it. And every knee bows, Philippians 2, and says, God, you are right. And they can only do that if they have them, them they are themselves are convinced that they are, on the, uh, they are exactly where they're supposed to be. Whether they're inside the city or out. Whoever is evil must... Go now, here's the key. That it's interesting to ask the grace people who say that they're going to be changed in the instant when, when he comes in the twinkling of an eye. Because it clearly in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, that's what uh, Paul is talking about. 
what he says, what happens prior to that? Well, in Revelation 22, 11, which occurs prior to Christ's coming, because he still puts him up in heaven. Look what he says. Whoever is evil must go on doing evil. And whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. And whoever is good must go on being good. And whoever is holy must go on being holy. He says that. He says, the die is set. No one's going to change. The people who are holy are going to go on being holy at this point. The people that are not holy, the people that are sinning, are going to go on being sinning. And guess what I'm going to do? The books are closed. Why are they closed? Because everyone's made a decision. I don't need to keep the storehouse open for uh, uh, genome rewriting. There's no one that, uh, everyone that's wanted the rewriting has got it, and those who haven't have gone away. We're closing shop, and now I can come to the earth, and we can, we can close this thing. He has not arrived yet. The twinkling of an eye hasn't occurred. And he has said very clearly, at this, from this point on, those who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing are going to continue doing it. Even when I come, they're going to continue doing it. My coming is not going to change a sinner into a saint. So that what happens in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 is not God remaking our minds. It's something else. And we do have a suggestion of what that is in genome. It's a very easy suggestion. It's the 40% or so of the mobile genetic elements that, have been, that are locked up from a, from a zygote stage all the way on up and stay locked up. If they ever come undone, you get cancer and you die. Or worse, you just die, period. That's what needs to be re taken away from all of us. But it has nothing to do with any of our moral choices. It's bad code that just will destroy the organism within, well, look at Gethsemane. Within hours, it will destroy it. Are we expected to do something? I'm going to go very quickly here. We have to remain under. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What do, what do I mean by work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? We're quoting Philippians 2, 12 and 13. When you look at Christ and you say, I'm not like Christ in this, and I'm not in, like Christ in that, and you start putting down, you start looking, you say, wow, I've got a lot of things here. What do I do? And God says, well, let's go to work. Where would you like to start? And you say, well, I really want to get rid of this lying problem. Every time I get into a hard place, I lie. And God says, okay, let's do that. Let's start working on that. Let's work on that code. Let's work on that code. And as you're working on that, is that starting to get better? And we're going to we're going to see what that entails here in a moment. Then God says, "Well, uh, do you want to start something else?" You go, "Yes, I really want to stop gossiping. I really hurt a good friend the other day, and I really got to stop it. And I'm I'm addicted to it." And God says, "Okay, let's put that on the burner. Let's work on that together." Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Here's the good news way, interprets it this way. To get this done, I toil and struggle, using the mighty strength with God's supplies, and which is at work in me. This is, Paul is talking about sanctification here. And he's saying he does, he toils. You want to talk about work, you want to talk about effort. Okay, where is he, where is the effort? What do we toil and struggle with, if not grace and works. So let's forget grace and works. It's a legal answer to a physical problem. It doesn't work. It never will. Let's just jettison it. And now let's look and say, well, we've got a physical problem. What makes sense? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, that is brought to its end, finished, and entire, wanting nothing. James is saying, when you're brought into temptations, or worse, when bad things happen to you, rejoice. What in the world? When I first read this, when I was young in the faith, I didn't like this text. I skipped it. And James goes on in James 1, as you, uh, when you get around the 1415 area, and he reiterates it and makes it worse. And then there's, you know, Hebrews. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and whips every son whom he receives. If you endure chast chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what a son is, he whom the father chastens not. But if you... But, I'm sorry, but God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? In other words, 
which son, if you have a loving father, he is going to discipline his son. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, that means all are partakers that are going to heaven, then you are bastards and not sons. If God, if God only works with those that he is going to save, he takes out the pruning shears with those he's going to save. If you go to a physician, he says, you've got lung cancer, we need to do surgery. Only those that keep going back to the physician say, okay, we've got to get rid of it. Is this surgery going to hurt? He goes, yeah, it's going to hurt. It's going to put you under for three months. What do you want? Do you want to keep the cancer? It's going to kill you. Or do you want to go for surgery and remove it? We have a genetic cancer. It's got to come out and parts of its removal are tough. And that's where the rub comes in. This book was published in 1981, and I read it in the mid-1980s, when bad things happen to good people. The Harold Kirshner goes through and gives some heart-rendering stories. Good people. Bad things happen to them. Why? And I had some friends who decided to follow God, Christ, and get into reading the book and the word and as soon as they did that they said their lives fell apart I thought things were supposed to be good I thought once you signed on to this it was nothing but rose petals and sunshine and they're getting exactly the opposite what's going on here God anyway Abraham goes leaves Ur of the Chaldees and goes to Canaan and he's not there for a couple of years and there's a huge drought which sends him down to Egypt. What's going on here, God? You took me out of a bread basket and you put me here and there's immediately a famine. What is going on? But rejoice as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Rejoice when you're being stressed. Come on. You don't hear these very much in evangelistic meetings, I've discovered. These texts just never seem to make it onto the agenda. But they should. Because the people that are coming in need to be warned. There's an earthquake coming. We're going to have to do some major changes, and some of them will not be easy. They will test you just like they tested Abraham with Isaac. They will test you to the utmost. What this says, I'm going to just read the underlying part. In addition, we examine our own recent findings that stress interacts with epigenome to regulate the expression of transposable elements in regional areas. Remember, I told... Well, let me go on. I'm going to... Environmental stress and transposon transcription in the mammalian brain. The glucocorticoid receptor, well, let me read this, mechanisms governing the expression of a large number of mobile genetic elements, and that is subject to the regulation by an activated glucocorticoid receptor. What happens when you get put under stress? You put out cortisol and it triggers that receptor. What, 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 what happens when this occurs? You open up the heterochromatin which your body has sequestered all these mobile genetic elements into. They, go, they are now liberated. If God's going to come in there and rewrite the code, if he's going to come in there and, and destroy the devil's code and rewrite it, he's got to have access to that part of the genome. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I should say, the, the stress that you have in the, in the environment, whether it's in relationships or financial or physical they all have a certain part of the mobile genetic elements a different part that they release God has to get to the code which you've worked hard with God with the Holy Spirit to sequester now we've got to go in there and the stuff that is not destroyable we need to rewrite some of it is just ready to be burned up when it comes, but there is a certain amount of it that carries information that needs to be rewritten because you won't be you without it. He's only got one way to get in there. He's got to stress you on that very point. Open up that part of the DNA, and when that's open, you're fair game because the devil is coming in at that point and saying, what are you doing? There's something very wrong here. Why would God allow this to happen to you? He's not a loving God. No loving God would let this happen to you. 
He's abandoned you. This is a joke. See, I told you following his way wasn't worth it. Get, get real. Get off of this. And God's saying, no, stay right here. I'm in the middle of rewriting the code. If you jump and you bolt, guess what happens? The devil has, th that, that code is open. He can multiply those mobile genetic elements until the cows come home. There's a risk involved. You're opening up this section. Either God's going to rewrite it and cover it open, or he is going to, oh, you're going to bolt and run, and the devil's going to get a field day to add more fuel to his fire. There's risk involved. That's why the Bible keeps saying, he that endures to the end. He that stays under to the end. He that stays connected to the mother carry ship to the end will win. We will, we will do it. All the code that needs to be rewritten will be rewritten. But if you bolt soon and you don't stay with me, we got problems. And if you don't come back and keep coming back, we've got real problems. In fact, you may decide not to come back and hook up again. But there's, we've got to do it. There's only one, th one way to get this done. Here we are again. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. What's the cross? Staying under. Staying connected to the mothership. You're going to have hurricane winds come and hit you from one side or another. Stay connected. Don't move. Don't leave. What does it say? You are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold. Remember we say gold is good co code? That perishes. Bad cold, gold that perishes would be bad code. Through it, be though it be tried with fire, and it will at the end, might be found to the praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. The genome has to be put under stress to clean it up. God's going to work in all of the same principles and the laws he's established. He's not going to go outside of them. He's not going to, like Tinkerbell at Disneyland, go, ding, all of your MGs are gone. He can't do that and keep you, you. The only way he can do this is take section by section and you work together and it, this is removed and it's removed from all the systems and you're aware of it and you know of it and you agree to it. That's the only way to keep you, you. Because straight, remember what he said here, there in Matthew 7, 13, 14, there's a lot of people that start out on this, but unfortunately very few that stick around to the end till the job is completed. And then like the pearl of great price, you've got to want this more than anything or you'll bolt. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. And here's the text. But he that shall endure, that means to remain, abide, not recede or flee, to the end, the same shall be saved. That's the key. You've got to stay. You're going to be buffered. You've got to go in and have that lung removed because it's got cancer and it's going to hurt. You're going to have a convalescence. But there's only one way to get it out and that's to have surgery. And here, now Jesus was risen early the first day of the week and he appeared to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. What if Mary at the end of six times had said, you know, this isn't working? I think I'm going to call it quits. Do you think she would have wept and broken the alabaster box at Simon's house? I don't. She came back for that seventh time and it took the seventh time for him to cast out the devil, quote and unquote, remove the mobile genetic elements before it took. that it will be formed. I'm going to stop here. We're going to pick up in a week on the Sabbath because it has to do with removing mobile genetic elements. So, we still have to talk about the Sabbath and telling others and then we're going to get into the, what, the investigative judgment and then what happens to those who turn God down on its gracious offer. January 11 is the date, the first date I can do it. So I'm sorry. And then after that, we're going to talk about maybe I have to redo lectures three and five because we don't, we didn't capture the data on them. And so I'll be looking to do those again. And if some of you want to come, that's great because I do better with a live audience. So let's have prayer.
Dear Father, we thank you for your blessings and for the information you've given us. Be with us now as we go about this week, and may we aid and abet your Holy Spirit in his process of sanctification in each of us. Amen.